I'll see you around the corner. Hello. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm Colin, I'm just the facilitator for this session, and I just wanted to welcome you to Marjorie Jones' session, who you heard on board there. So, uh, over to Marjorie, will you just remind you that you keep mobile signals sort of for silence throughout the presentation, if it's good. Right, well, hello, everybody, um, and welcome to my session on document engineering and what I think we as technical communicators can learn from where software engineering has already been. Um, so, to start, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and about why I decided to talk about this. Um, this is me. Um, I'm not very photogenic and I'm not cute, but there are a couple of members of my family that are, so you may prefer to look at them <laughs> while I tell you about me. Um, I'm the sole technical author for a company called Exony. I am an ex-software engineer. Um, I started in software in the 1980s, and eventually I realized I preferred writing about software to writing software. Um, so I've been a technical author for eight years, um, and I've used Word since the pre -MS, well, since MS-DOS, um, pre-WYSIWYG, and I've used Flare for about the last three years. So why did I decide to talk about this? Well, I was working in software while software was going from big monolithic programs to structured programming, and I saw the journey, and I watched the processes and practices developed, and I saw what went well and things that went wrong. And the more I use structured authoring tools, the more convinced I am that there are many, many parallels. And almost on a daily basis, I do things in the way that I work because I know software would do it that way because it's a good thing and it works for software um, and it helps manage the complexity and the challenges of developing structured software. And um, so I just thought maybe I'd tell you about some of them. So in this session, hopefully I'll leave a little bit of time for questions at the end. There's lots and lots I could say, but David Farby says I can't have all afternoon to say it. So some of the, like the, the initial scene setting slides, I am going to gloss over a little bit. They're things I just want to mention, but they're, you know, they're not like the core of my talk. Um, but if there's anything that I whiz through early on um, and you want to talk to me afterwards about it, come find me. I could, I'll talk all afternoon or all night if you want me to. Um, because what I want to do is concentrate on some practical tips that maybe, you know, things maybe you've not thought of that might be of some use to you. So, what, what is document en engineering? Well, what do I mean by document engineering? I made the term up, but I'm sure I'm not the first. Um, what I mean is the process of constructing your documentation from component parts, not, not just writing it. Um, and I'm not talking about the structure of your output. I'm talking about how you decompose the blocks that make up your content, your, like your source content, um, and the tools and the processes that you need to make sure that when you assemble them into your output or outputs, you're actually assembling them into what you think you've assembled them. Um, now, this covers much, it's much more than topic based authoring or ditter or using a structured authoring tool um, or single sourcing although all of these are things that help us with document engineering um, so who needs to become a document engineer well I think all of us anyone who is using or is planning to use a structured authoring tool um, where you build individual components that you assemble into your final output I use flair um, but what I'm saying, I think, will apply to almost anyone who's using a structured authoring tool, or many bits of that will. Um, the terms and so the terms and the techniques may be different, but the I think the principles in general will be the same. Um, anyone who's single sourcing will probably find some things here that they can take away. Um, if you're working in a big documentation team um, in a on a big project where accuracy and agility is important, then you may well be doing some of these things because you will have to. If you aren't, then you won't be producing the document that you, your documentation your um, client requires. So what I'm going to cover, first of all, I'm going to um, cover what I think we can learn, wh no, why, sorry, why we must learn from software engineering, why I think it's really important. Then I'm going to give you a really quick whiz through Software Engineering 101. And these two sections, there are one or two places where I'm just going to like do a bit of a whiz through. And then, hopefully, I'm going to concentrate on 
some lessons for us, things we can actually take away. So, how it was then? Well, when I started programming, this was how it was like. You got your program, you, one, one person, one program, big fat listing, tens or hundreds of thousands of lines of code, you'd get your listing, and it was like a wodge like this from the, the, the printout room. And how documentation used to be before we went structured. Here's an example Word document, page 408 to 419. One, one mega document, one author, because that's the only way you can do it. Um, so here's a, like a, a very quick comparison slide, some comparison points. Software was monolithic and unstructured, one program, one programmer, no reuse, no formal methodologies, no good practices that were enforced inconsistency. Documentation, exactly the same. One document, one author, no formal methodologies, inconsistent formatting and structure. Got your photograph? Right, this is one of my whiz slides. So how it is now? Well, this is just a random picture of a software. Um, it's, it's a UML model. It's one of the tools that software engineers use to design their software. The content doesn't matter. It's more, I'm just trying to show you that software has specific tools and technologies that they can use to do their design in manageable chunks, so they are sure that what they have designed is what they're implementing, and then they can test it. So that's where software has gone now from that mega monolithic programming. So here's a similar comparison slide. Software is component and structured, one program, multiple programmers, reusable components, etc., etc. Documentation going exactly the same way. Componentized, structured documentation, multiple authors contribute to one document. Um, hopefully, tool, tools will enforce good practices, standardized formatting, etc. Got your photograph, Catherine? Right. Okay, so how was the software journey? Well, I was there. And it was a rocky road and winding and tortuous at times. Did this work for software? Not always initially. In 1983, I started work as a junior programmer um, for Portsmouth City Council. And just before I joined, they had done their first project using this new structured programming. And it was awful. It was disastrous. It was buggy. It was hard to maintain. You couldn't find your way around it. If you changed something, you broke something else completely unrelated. They said it didn't work and they weren't going to do a project using structured programming again. Um, that was 1983 and I guess they've changed their mind now. But the lesson um, is that you can't just take something big and complicated, chop it into lots of little pieces, share them around multiple people to build, and somehow expect that they assemble, all these bits will assemble itself into what you want. You need the right pieces, you need tools and processes to manage the complexity and to identify problems, and you need an assemble and test phase to make sure that what you have constructed is actually what you meant to construct. And Software engineers spent the next 15 years or so were developing and refining methodologies to, to do this. And I, and I was there, and I watched this happen. Um, so the benefits of applying what software have learned for documentation and the benefits that software got was that you got increased reusability, you got increased efficiency, you didn't have to keep redoing things, you were more flexible, things were easier to change. The results were more accurate, what you built was more maintainable, and there was excuse me, my uh, point is just like there. And there was less rework required, and rework is always costly. Um, and the risks of not doing it for software and for us, the risks are that you are where Portsmouth City Council was in 1983, where they said we tried it, it didn't work. Not only is there no benefit, it cost us. We're not doing it again. And just coincidentally, I recently heard of a team of writers who decided to move to Flair and did very little planning, had no understanding of how to decompose their content, no real um, understanding that they needed to test the outputs, and they too said they had seen no business benefit and they probably wouldn't do another project in Flair. So that's why I think we need to learn from software. And... Uh, so some key points for us. There are many, many similarities between software and structured documentation. Um, 
And if you're using a structured documentation tool and assemble your content from multiple outputs, your content development process will be similar, not identical, but similar to software. Now, if you're a technical communicator and you're documenting software, you will probably find that many of the processes and tools that I'm going to mention are already available to you because your software engineers are using them already. So it probably will be quite easy if you're not doing one of these things and you think it will benefit you, it will probably be quite easy to hook into what they're doing. Um, so borrow what the software engineers are doing. And what works for software, I think most of the time will work for us. And what goes wrong for software, and still does if you don't do software properly, can go wrong for us too. So, software engineering 101, a real quick, everything you need to know about software engineering in 30 seconds. Software has a life cycle, and you start with your specification, and that's where you say what you're going to build. Then you design it. You say how you're going to build what you want to build. Then you have an implementation stage where you actually build what you're going to build. Then you put all the bits together and you do system testing. You test that the thing you've built is what you meant to build. Then you go into maintenance, which is where you fix problems, and you might build some more. You may well go around again, do a bit more specification, a bit more design, a bit more implementation, a bit more system testing. Now, it's very hard at any stage to be sure that you've got everything right until you move into the next stage. It's difficult when you do your design to be absolutely sure you've got it right um, until you start doing some implementation. That flushes out some problems. So there is, we used to call it a corkscrew. You do it, you go around, you do a little bit more. What is costly is when you find something in a late stage and it means a change right back at the beginning. If you find something in system testing phase and it means you've got to change your specification, that could have an enormous um, implication further down. So it's important where possible that you check each stage is effectively good enough to go on to the next stage. Um, because the earlier you find mistakes, the better it is. So now, software over the years has developed some procedure, procedures and some tools which help them do this. There's lots we can learn from these, um, but that's a topic for another day. I'm, m a couple of things I will pick up in specific examples, but so here are some processes, uh, some pr processes and procedures that software engineers use. Um, you can get your camera out in a minute, Catherine. And here are some of the tools. Um, for, for the moment, just be aware that software has lots of things to help them. Um, so. Where we're going now is I'm going to go through each of the stages of the software engineering life cycle, and I'm just going to explain some things that software engineers do and give us some tips um, for things I think we can do. Um, so first of all, we'll go to the specification. Now, this is where you identify your problem and you decide what you are going to build to solve your problem. Um, for technical communication, this covers the structure, the content, the formats of our final output. Now, I'm not going to say anything more about that because there are plenty of people who know far more about that than I do. Some of them are, many of them are at this conference. I've sat in their sessions. Um, people like the content strategists, the user experience designers, um, many bloggers, I don't know what, like, just pick a couple of examples, Sarah O'Keefe at Scriptoria, Mark Baker on every page is page one. These are all people who are helping us to understand what we, sh what we should be building as technical communicators, what our output should be like. Um, so th there's, um, there are parallels with software, but that, that's not the bit I'm going to talk about. Um, where I'm really interested... Um, is the des from the design stage on. Um, the design is how you build what you've specified. Um, now, does this matter to technical communicators in a structured world? Yes. Um, it's not enough to define a few nice styles and to make sure that you write in a tone and a voice that meets your users' needs and that you follow your style guide. Um, without upfront design and planning, things are going to get out of control. Um, so, I've just picked a couple of lessons from the field of software that, that maybe we could learn. Um, and if you think this might work for you, then, then great. Um, but so, one of the things comes in the planning stage. You kind of need to plan 
what you're going to build. You, and this covers for me is things like deciding naming conventions, project names, folder structures. These sorts of things can be costly to change later. Um, agree common ways of working, especially if you've got more than one author. It won't all fit together unless you agree how you sort of how it's how it's going to look and what your bits need to look like. Um, a project with multiple authors will fall apart quite quickly if you don't do this. Even if there is only you, sooner or later, if you don't put a little bit of planning into how, you, how you're going to put your components together, eventually you will fall apart or you'll, you'll discover it's not scalable, that what you're doing worked while you had one Flare project, now you've got 93 documents in Flare, um, it just doesn't work. And another area that we can get some uh, tips from software um, is in the actual component design. Now, the components, I'm talking about your individual building blocks. These will vary with the tool. You have topics in something like Flare or RoboHelp. You may have snippets, ditto, um, so reusable content, Ditter, and other tools will have the same concept, call them different names. Almost every moving part your tool uses could be regarded as a component. So you could include variable sets, your targets, your condition sets. Um, and they need to be designed. And you need to identify and design your components carefully, or you'll find you don't have the right ones, or you can't find them. Um, and it depends on the tool. Some tools give you more help than others. Some enforce good practices. Some let you do things that probably would be better undone. Um, take extra care with common components because they'll be much more costly to change later on. Um, so now I'm just going to give you a few component design tips from the world of software. When you design your components, software engineers talk about high cohesion and low coupling. Um, that means that closely related things belong together and things that aren't closely related are kept separate. That's just a good engineering practice. Um, and I'll give you an example in a minute of um, a, a made up example of, of of um, high cohesion and low coupling. Also, where possible, you're aiming for no unnecessary dependencies. Dependencies make components harder to reuse, and changes may have unexpected side effects. If, you, if things are dependent, then you change one thing, it might break something you didn't expect. Um, you, are you, you, you want to design something that's easy to maintain. Um, no unnecessary duplication. Duplicated information in software is a really bad idea because it gets out of step. You change it in one place, you forget about it, um, and you have somewhere else where it's no longer common. Um, and in my day, well, when I started, we used to have this KISS acronym, and it, you, you, we used to say it meant keep it simple, stupid, which maybe is not politically correct now, but just because you can do something and the tool supports it and you're clever enough to work out how to do it doesn't mean you should do it. Because will you remember how you did it in six months' time? Will anyone, ever else, anyone else ever remember? Simple is always better if you're choosing between different ways of doing things. And it's hard sometimes to go from a complicated, messy implementation to something that's clean and simple. But the simpler you can make it, and the simpler and the clearer it is, the better it's going to be. So here's my example. This is um, a hypothetical, soft, soft, let's say I'm single sourcing some software installation instructions for several similar components. And they've all got the same two, I don't know if you can actually read the words, two preparation steps. Install the prerequisite software and configure the security settings, let's just say. So I think, OK, Lots of component, lots of um, similar products are going to need these same two steps. So I am going to make a snippet, and I'm going to whack all that, all that preparation stuff as a snippet, and then whatever installation manual I've got, preparing to install X, Y, Z, A, B, C, one snippet job done. Actually, no, because what you have done is you have got high coupling. You have coupled two things together that are that are. Um, not closely related, the installing the prerequisite software, the configuring the security settings. And if you ever need to, um, t 
to, if, if you ever need to put something else in, another step in between the two in one place, or only use one of them, you'll be stuck. Start off by making two, um, two separate um, sections. Um, so that's design. Now we're moving on to the implementation, the how you build it. For most of us, this is what we do in our day-to-day -day job most of the time. Um, software engineers have, tend to divide into three related sections, coding, debugging, and unit testing. Coding is where you create the content. Debugging, you build it as you go, fix the problems. And in unit testing, you test what the bit you built before you hand it over. So I'm just going to go quickly through each of these steps with a few tips. Um, so coding is what we do when we open our authoring tool and we write for us. And some things that software engineers do that we should seriously consider, source control. Um, all software engineers use source control to manage the versioning and the branching and all that. It prevents multiple conflicting changes, allows you to baseline files. If you don't use it, consider whether you should, because you have a large number of small parts to keep track of. Um, if you document software, use what your software developers use. Otherwise, something like SharePoint may be suitable. But if you're not using it, I, I would encourage you to consider using it. Also, again, keep it simple. Simple solution is better. Just because you can write a sentence in Flare with five different conditions and make it multicolored, um, not only will your translators hate you, but it's going to be hard to maintain. Um, and finally, if you really must do it, comment it. This is what software engineers do when something's not immediately obvious, when something may trip you up. For technical communicators, work out how to embed comments in your code. Now in Flare, I have a comment condition. It's never, ever, ever appears in any output, but I use it when there's something in a topic or something in a snippet that I, I need to remember and I want to draw to the attention of anyone else who's working on that topic um, and keep them up to date. Here's an example. This is a snippet, a flare. It's a, it's a snippet for that handles in, an installation or an upgrade. And in this particular case, the instructions are almost identical, bar for a couple of places. So I've used a flare snippet condition, but this snippet will only work correctly if you apply the right snippet condition when you use it. If you don't to tell Flare whether you want the install version or the upgrade version, you'll get both. So I've just, in a Flare condition, which never appears in the output, I've just put a comment, warning, contains a snippet condition, make sure you set one. And it's any time anyone uses that snippet and says, what I want is this installation sequence, they know they must set it. Um, so that's quick whiz through coding. Debugging, fi finding and fixing problems, now, in a structured tool, it's a bit more than just the odd, um, the odd broken cross-reference. Um, so some techniques from software engineering may help us. Um, the first, if, if something goes wrong and it's not obvious, first of all, do read the error message. Sometimes they give you quite a lot of help. Sometimes they don't. Um, check your assumptions. If the problem's not obvious, then you're looking for something that isn't what you think it is. Um, make sure, for, let's say you've made a change in a style sheet and the change is not, um, isn't coming out in your content. Are you using the right style sheet? Have you changed the right style? Something that I've done when I've been puzzled is, say, make an obvious change, like change my text to 40-point red. Now, if that doesn't come out either, then I know that I'm, I've either not changed the, the style that is in force or I've not changed it in the right style sheet. And if it still goes wrong and you're having to poke around, collect some evidence. Um, I, I quite often grab screenshots of error messages. If I... If I'm changing settings to see, well, maybe this helps it, maybe that won't, I just grab screenshots of that and write down what I'm doing. Then when I know that I fixed it, at least I can work out what it was I changed. Um, and a couple of specific tips on the next couple of slides. So a technique that I find really useful that software engineers use is called a binary chop. You've got a project and it's broken. It won't build and you don't know why and there's not enough clue to help you. So here's your broken project. I had an example, I had a topic with a lot of cross-references, one of them was reporting an error and the error message wasn't clear enough for me to work out which one it was, it just didn't give me enough information. I cut my topic into two and I built the first bit, fine, broken cross-reference wasn't in that bit. So I built the second bit, er error message for the broken cross-reference, had a look, still couldn't find it, I cut that in two again. 
and the broken cross ref when I built the first bit, the broken cross reference error message came out. Um, didn't bother to build the second bit because I guessed that would be okay. I cut the first bit in two again. The first bit was fine. Broken cross reference error message appeared in the second. By that time, I only had a little tiny few paragraphs left. So I looked at it and I found what was wrong. So that's a really useful technique that software engineers use um, on occasions. I've used it when I've had a whole project and I get some random internal error, error message. And it's obviously one of my topics that's causing it, but I don't know which one. I just throw away half the topics and see if it appears with the half that I've got left. Just a word of warning, if you do start cutting things out, sometimes you start getting other error messages because you will get other broken cross-references, which are just because you've not got all the bits you need. So you need to be a little bit careful. Um, and don't forget the power of reset. Sometimes, actually, just closing and reopening, closing, maybe deleting a few temporary files or rebooting, um, sometimes even with Word, that's all you need to do. If everything else has foxed you, it's just worth a try. So unit testing, um, it's more than just our SME review. Um, in software engineering, it's done by someone who's close to the content. Um, do we need to do it? Yes, because in Word, you can see what the final output is. Um, it's really important. We need to be methodical. Um, we need to test everything, even small changes. And here is an example of where it saved me. I was told I had to change the company address. Um, I thought, in all our documents, Word documents, easy, do it. See, I've done it. In Flare, I thought, high time, the address was a snippet. Let's make it a snippet. Propagated it to all my products, all my projects. I thought, just before I let it into the wild, I will just check. And what I'd done is I'd changed the snippet. Uh, I'd, I'd made everything a snippet, and I'd not changed the address. Easy mistake to make. But considering that the CEO wanted the company registered address changed, um, and that their unit testing saved me. It was me saying, I will just build this in an output, check my output before I do it. That's testing the little bit I've built to check it makes sense. Um, and system testing, this is where... In software engineering, you test what you built and see whether it meets what you want it to do. Does it matter for us? Do we need to do it? Yes, yes, and yes. It's independent. It's done by someone who's not the original builder. And in a world where we're writing individual components, what we see isn't what necessarily appears in the final output. Um, so very, very quickly, um, one of the things you can do is regular builds because that helps flush out errors. Um, but unlike software engineers, we don't have automated tests. So you can, if you've got testers, you can help them to test you, to help them to help you. Even, and I'll give you an example in a minute, even if you haven't got testers, um, you can, for your final output, what I've done in the past is just written a checklist and ask, uh, here's a PDF, I want you to check that all the headers are right, that the footers are right, that this is right, that, it's got, that the section numbers are this, that and the other. Just get somebody to check rather than shipping out what you've produced without, um, which you've only seen in its component parts. Here's an example. I have to, we've just been bought out my company. New company logo, change the company logo, um, I build it, I build my PDFs, I do my unit testing, I check that the output, the company logo has appeared. I give it to, I, I give it to, um, to, to be ready to, build in, to be built into our software distribution CD, and I tell the system testers, please check that the, comp the new company logo is in the PDFs. And that was what appeared on my machine, on my little laptop here. This is what appeared on the build machine. And the reason was that on the build machine was running Java 6. Our new company logo was an SVG image instead of a PNG, and Flare needs Java 7 to process SVG images. Now, if I'd not flagged that to the system testers to help them to help me, if I'd not said, I've made this change, I want you to check the new company logo is in the output, then what would have happened? We would have written a CD of all these automated generated documents and there would have been little little grey squares where the company logo should have been from the flare output, not from the word. I could see what's gone in the word output. So 
Maintenance, well, I'm probably pretty well out of time, aren't I, Colm? But maintenance, basically, lessons for us. It's easy if you consider as you write, don't cut corners, and remember to put your comments in. And I think, so that's what I said, what we must, why we must learn, a bit about software engineering and some lessons. Anybody got any questions? Karen. I have a specific question about your commenting. Yes. Because, yeah, in code, it's very nice to have, like, slash dot dot over mm. um, the comments. And then you can say, the next bit is going to cover this. Everything is clear. And it's also, it's in your face together with the code. And we only recently created a comment in Flare where you could use the style <coughs> because somebody in particular had asked for it. So you would have it. Yes, I know. So I'm just wondering if you have any concerns about the comments um, as, a, as a thing. You don't want it to go out, but you want to keep it when you're making your new comments. So do, do I have concerns about the comments? Right, well, I, the way that I've talked about commenting here, that, that, was, that, was pure, that was not commenting as in word commenting where you are writing a comment about the content that you want a reviewer to read. That, my, what I covered as commenting was comments that you, as a, as, a, as a document engineer, want to be visible to anyone who works on your content. And in that case, no, I don't have any concern because I use, I use a condition that is always excluded from all my output. So the only time that comment ever appears is if you are working on that, on that topic. Now, what you're talking about is, a, is certainly in flair is a problem because you can put annotations which correspond, say, to word comments and they never appear in an output which means you can't get them to your reviewers unless they use contributor. What I have done is I've defined what I call review styles. I've defined an annotation style and a highlight style because sometimes you want to write a, a, a note, let's call it a, an annotation to a reviewer or you actually want to highlight a section that's changed so you're saying I'm giving you this great long topic and actually I only want you to focus on these three paragraphs that I've changed so I've defined separate styles for those and I have a separate review style sheet and a separate review target and my review target has all the annotation style comes out in italics blue background and the highlight style comes out. You can either have green or you can have um, yellow highlight or you can have red text, which gives you like three different variants if you want to say, you know, reviewer A, look at the green and reviewer B, look at the, the yellow. And so that's in my review style sheet. And in my production style sheet, the annotations do not come out at all. And the highlighting appears it goes in the document but it's got no it's got no highlight it just looks like ordinary text it took me a couple of weeks to work out how to do that and one of the things i'm planning to do is write a blog post about how i did it um, but i haven't got around to doing it yet <laughs> but yeah so that's the difference between like comments at source level for who's someone who's actually working on the code and comments as you would understand it as a word user like annotations to, to your reviewer. As an example, it's, we don't use comments on the scale of media like sound effects. But the sort of thing I've got a lousy memory, that's why. No <laughs> we've got examples where we might have contact centered help calls inside the application and we've got them point to a specific topic. Um, but we work, we work in such a way, we're almost like a matrix team, so one of us might be working on somebody going into a topic and saying, oh, hang on, this topic's rubbish anymore. I'll move this content over here mm. and then deleting the topic so that when you give a context in help call, there's nothing that gets deleted. So 
Yes, yes. Com comments need to be where they, they need to be up to date. If you use them, keep them up to date. Out of date comments, no good at all. They they need to be where you're going to see them. And I, um, when I was planning this, I had another example. There was some text in one of my topics where somewhere in someone in senior management had insisted I use that particular text. So I put it in as a comment: "Do not change." Mr. X says this is the wording we must use, although. Um, any sane technical author would say, oh, my God, that's awful. Um, but it does mean that nobody is going to ever change that text. But, yes, if you take nothing else away, take away the idea of comments. Anyone else? Thank you all very much. Thank you, that was fun.